This is David Bedford, author of The Fab 104 and Lady Paul Bird Plays the Beatles. You're listening to Every Little Thing with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. another edition of Things We Said Today. I'm Steve Marinucci, the author of the Beatles Examiner column and several Examiner columns on the Beatles on examiner.com. And I'm joined by my co-host on the other end of the country, Ken Michaels, host of Every Little Thing. Hi there. Hi there. How are you, Ken? (laughs) I'm fine. Okay. This week we're going to do something a little different. Number one, I'm opening the show. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's a little different. It but is. We're also we're also going to go through some of the we open the mailbag and we're going to talk about some of the mail we've gotten, and we're going to talk about some of the uh, many books that have come out around the 50th anniversary, including a few that probably haven't gotten a whole lot of notice. But uh, we're going to talk about that too. Uh, Ken, uh, you you've, you've got some uh, mail there that you want to you want to talk about. Yeah, there's a couple of emails that I thought we'd address here. And it's great, by the way, to get feedback on our shows. And uh, we hope to do more of this in upcoming shows. By all means, feel free to write to us about any of the programs that we do, any any of uh, the topics that we cover. But this one comes from uh, Joseph Brennan. And this is in response to our show that we did. This is like two programs back. And it concerned the success or lack of, depending on how you look at it, of um, Paul McCartney's new album, as well as the uh, Capitol releases of On Air and the U.S. albums. And this is what he wrote to us. He said, Could we lay some of the blame for the apparently poor sales of the U.S. album's box set on Apple or Universal Music Group? Why would you release a box of this magnitude in the middle of January? Why wasn't this set slotted for a Christmas release? You'd have boosted sales enormously, in my view. Another blown opportunity was the 1963 bootlegs that went up online at the last minute because of the copyright issue. Apple had just released the second volume of BBC recordings after 20 years, and six weeks later, something like 40 additional BBC tracks go online for a brief time. Shouldn't someone have anticipated that? Did no one think about releasing the 63 bootlegs on CD in January? Let's talk. Let's talk about those two things um, first, because well, well so we, b- before we do that, I mean, I, I asked you a question on this very nature, not just this, but Paul's albums, mm-hmm. whether or not you th- you think that this was a success or not, and you know, in in my personal opinion, uh, I just happen to feel that I'm just so grateful when Beatles CDs are on the charts at all, considering the fact that this music is forty to fifty years old despite the fact that you and I both feel that this is the greatest catalog ever, they're the greatest band ever, that's how we feel, okay? But these albums did make the charts, and when we were first talking about this a few weeks ago, there were 13 albums on Billboard's Top 200. Right. Okay, and I think that that's very impressive myself. Do you expect every single Beatles release, no matter what, to go Top 10 or Number 1 because it's the Beatles? Um, that's an interesting question. I think if we're just talking about, depending on what it is, I, I, it, I don't think it's going to happen. You know, I hate to say that, but I mean, I, you know, you can't expect that now. Uh, there's too much, too much outside pressure. There's too much, too many other things going on in the music industry that would, would be against them. Now, the fact remains that last week, there's still several Beatle albums on the, on the, on the charts. I wrote, I wrote a story about that, uh-huh. and and I was actually surprised that there were that many still there. I don't expect that's going to be the case this week because the the drop offs were, you know, were getting significant every week. There were several that were dropping off, so it, I really doubt there's going to be a a whole lot on this week. But they were still they're still holding on, and that's you know that's interesting. Um, well, based on what this listener wrote to us. Mm-hmm. He's kind of expecting, the impression I get anyway, is for these albums, for all of them to do well, no matter what, because it's the Beatles. And we've been spoiled all these years because the Beatles have done so phenomenally well through all the decades, 
And even in the last decade, as, as I've said so many times here, the one album was the number one album of the decade. Right. You know, I, so there are people who expect it. Well, and, I think part of, the, part of the issue here, with the if we're talking about the U.S. albums, uh-huh. was the, a lot of the online criticism about the box set. Do you I think, think that, that hurt the sales more than anything else? I think that I think it hurt it to uh, to a, a, an extent. Sure, there was a lot of criticism from blogs. In fact, I was going to mention this when we got down to the when we started talking about the magazines. I just today, just this afternoon, got a copy of the new issue of the nine ten from Doug Selby, and the whole issue is a track by track analysis of the U.S. album set, and I mean. Anybody that knows Doug's work, Doug is a fanatical about going through and, and detailing sound uh, sound issues with Beatles songs, and he went through every single track on that box set. And it's an it's a uh, I, I'm gonna as I'm sitting here, I just got it within the last hour, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do something a little longer uh, that will be online by the time this show is out, but. That kind of he wasn't he's not the first one to have complained about the U.S. albums box, and there were a number number of people who did a uh, what I would consider a very quick rap on sound issues. Um, Doug took a lot of time and and really did an extensive job. I think it's like eighteen pages hmm. of yeah. I'd like so, to read it. <laughs> yes, and. Um, there was a lot of let's put it this way, and I'm not blaming, and I'm not throwing blame on people who criticize the box set, I guess, but I'm saying there was a lot of buzz, and not only from the people who went through the set, but there was a lot of buzz anyway from people who just, you know, didn't think, you know, had problems with the box. The issue of when they released it had more to do with the 50th anniversary. That's what they were looking at. It really, and I have to say that putting it out at Christmas time really wouldn't have. Well, I don't think it would have would have been as special as it was putting it out in February uh, or January. in January, whenever yeah. the, you know when they put it out. Um, they put it out for the 15th anniversary. That's what they were doing. They, you know, so you can look at it and say, why didn't they put it out at Christmas? They should have put it out at Christmas, and and I'm going to say, they they put it out for the 50th anniversary, and they wanted to do something special, and that's what they decided to do. So, well, can I chime in here? Yes, you can. <laughs> first of all, I I partly agree with what Joseph has to say. First of all, I happen to believe, no matter what, that the people who care the most about the U.S. box set are really the first generation fans the ones who will buy everything and and care about the history of those records. And those numbers are dwindling. And it's just natural for that to happen. I don't think the average fan, especially a new Beatle fan, is going to care all that much about getting something new on CD. I just don't think that that matters. You know, I think uh, also a lot of the uh, a lot of the U.S. albums don't uh, a lot of the younger fans don't really relate to what the U.S. albums were. Right. And the sound, especially with the sound issues of the U.S. albums. I mean, Capitol did put out the the two Capitol albums box sets, you know, several years ago, that had the original mixes that replicated all those things. Mm-hmm. They chose not to do it this time, and you can either complain about that or not. They basically went for the sound quality of the remasters and kind of just. Formed, formed everything according to the, you know, to the track lineups of the of the U.S. albums, but, you know, and that I mean that's on its on its face it sounds like a, a horrible idea and, and a lot of, and like I said a lot of people have criticized them for that. So. But I do agree with Joseph in the sense that I do think that had the the U.S. box set the U.S. albums, if they came out in December, I think it would have helped a little bit better. The only thing is that. You had the Beatles bootleg, uh, the 1963 recordings coming out at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. So everything was so closely tied to each other, and at least, was, you know, a few, then, a few months there apart. there was Paul's album, too. You know, yeah, Paul's but the, the, this, the thing is, if they knew they were going to release the bootleg recordings the end of the year, they probably should have released on air 
several months before that. Mm -hmm. They probably didn't even know till the very end they were going to do that till the end of the year. That's my guess. So I think to help sales, and again, I'm not expecting the U.S. albums to have done with, with all the CDs going top 10 or the box set going top 10. I think it would have done better if it had been released for Christmas. Well, again, we have the issue of the, of the bootleg recordings that came out with barely with no publicity from Capitol, mm -hmm. no information from uh, other than the you know the report that I had um, of of it coming out, and the thing still it made not only made the charts, but it I mean it did very well, and they're to the point where they're thinking about doing another one. Right. So it did um, very well for a week. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But I mean, the fact that it it got a it got a, an inc incredible amount of buzz. It got, I think, I think if you compared the buzz that it got versus the U.S. albums, it got more buzz, and that was without any help, basically. Right. Um, but as far as the U.S. albums are concerned, mm -hmm. I don't think it would have hurt if it came out in December as opposed to January because it's still very close to the 50th anniversary, and you, you would have, have had Christmas. Have the two you would have had the bootlegs and the and the U.S. albums right on top of each other. Well, my argument is that between On Air and the bootleg recordings, they should have been released earlier. Everything should have been released earlier. Um, I think that the timing of the, the bootleg record... I'm guessing, I should say, I'm, I'm, I think, I'm guessing. I'm guessing the timing of the bootleg recordings was intentional. That it was going to happen, it was going to happen then no matter what. Now, Dylan, of course... Did um, his a little earlier that uh, the vinyl set that he put out, the Beach Boys uh, Big Beat set, which also came out with barely any word, happened just about the same time as as or it happened on the same date I think as the bootleg recordings did. So the Beatles weren't the only ones to do that. So I definitely think it was intentional. I think there's no question. Well, just to continue what Joseph wrote here, mm -hmm. he said, did no one think about releasing the 63 bootlegs on CD in January after everyone had gorged on the box set and the BBC collection? Well, they, they couldn't have done that anyway. They couldn't have, no. To protect Absolutely themselves, not. it had to come out in 2013. Right. So you have to think with the mindset of the bootleg recordings are coming out in December no matter what. Then how do you release, when do you release everything else, on air and the U.S. albums? Again, we can sit here and play armchair quarterback, um, we honestly do not know, and Capital is not saying. Right. And they're not giving it, you know. So, you know, we don't know what happened there. We well, don't. obviously this bothers our listener, and I, I love the fact that, you know, fans are passionate about this. Right, and I'm, I, but I'm saying, you know, I'm in, in a situation like this, um, I think there's more than meets the eye here. So mm -hmm. my, my feeling well, let me just finish the rest of this letter. The mantra should have been, keep the momentum going. Apple should study how Capital marketed the Beatles in the 60s. They could learn a thing or two. As for McCartney's new, an artist of his age is going to have trouble selling albums, period. His time as a chart force is long gone. The fact that he debuted at number three is really quite an accomplishment. And that's how the letter ends. Well, okay. I don't know why, why that doesn't bother this listener. You know, it shouldn't be because of his age, why his records sell or not, or why it's given the the minimal airplay that it's been given. You know, that's just something that we discussed in the show, and it, it, it concerns all the veteran artists, and it's really shameful. It's not just Paul McCartney. And uh, I don't know why that doesn't seem to bother this listener as much, because, you know, it's still Paul McCartney, and it's still a great album, and it should have gotten more acknowledgement. Well, for some reason... If you look at it from, and I mean, you can see this probably a little better than I can. From a radio standpoint, uh, I mean, was New a great radio album as far as you're concerned? I think there are a lot of tracks on there that were radio friendly. Mm -hmm. I could certainly hear Save Us being played a lot. Mm -hmm. I could hear Everybody Out There being played a lot. You know, I could hear I Can Bet being played a lot. And right. it's not just because I like those songs. I think they work very well on the radio. Right. The answer would seem to be that 
a lot of radio, you know, uh, programmers didn't feel that way. The question is why, and and you know, I, I, I it is disappointing. I mean, because it was a great album, and it, it you know, and uh, it should have done better for, especially for all the work he put into it. Yeah, but I'm saying it's more because the program directors don't want to program older artists like that. Well, I, I think it has very little to do with the music. What about Neil Young, though? Right. What about him? He's having he, trouble getting airplay. You don't think he gets more? Does he get more airplay than McCartney? I think he does. Do you? Uh, I don't know. With his new stuff? I don't think so. Mm. Okay. There are a few artists out there, like Paul Simon. His last album did fairly well. Mm-hmm. Nowhere in the, in the League of Graceland. But, you know, it's still, it's still got some airplay. It got decent airplay. You know, mm-hmm. John Fogarty's last one got a little bit of airplay. You know, I'm not saying that these artists are totally ignored, but they're not given the heavy airplay that they used to. Right. Because they want to program artists that cater to younger people. Right. And yeah, in their minds, it, the younger audience is not going to go for a veteran like that. That's, and that's the issue right there, is the, 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 veterans, uh, the veterans don't get it in general. I'm, in fact, one of, one of our listeners complained... Uh, told me that Neil Young has been complaining about this, about the lack of airplay that veterans are getting on the radio. Mm. Sure. It's one thing if the music isn't that good, but when there's a lot of effort put behind it, and there's so many veterans still to this day, like the ones we mentioned that are putting out great material, it should get played just like it did in the past. Right. Oh, yeah, no, I know, and that's, that's true. Um. Anyway, there's another letter here to read. Okay. Um, this concern our last show with uh, James A. Mitchell, okay, uh, which dealt with uh, John's political time and elephant's memory. He has a new book out called The Walrus and the Elephants, John Lennon's Years of Revolution. And uh, I mentioned during the show that um, Elvis Presley, uh, in his book, Elvis Presley had issued a memo saying that the Beatles had been a force for anti-American spirit. Well, one of our listeners named Ghosty, <laughs> the last name here, it just says TMRS. Anyway, Ghosty writes, Beatle fans should take Elvis's comments about the Beatles in his letter to Nixon with a grain of salt. Elvis wanted a narcotics officer's badge for his collection and to give him the legal authority to transport drugs from state to state. The Bureau of Narcotics does not hand out badges. So Elvis went over their heads and appealed directly to the president. He wrote a letter to Nixon while on the plane to D.C. for this unscheduled appointment and filled it with everything he knew Nixon wanted to hear. As Jerry Schilling, who was there, writes, Elvis knew how to get to anyone. Elvis's ploy worked and he got his badge, and I think we can all conclude that this was a really bad idea for all involved, especially Elvis. Hmm. So uh, I'm glad that uh, Ghosty wrote in with that because it, it puts a whole fresh perspective on it. And that this was really done just uh, so that Elvis could get this badge. Mm-hmm. You know, he may not have felt that way at all about the Beatles. Yeah. That's, that's quite interesting. It's quite interesting. Okay. Anyway, so before we get to talk about uh, some books, recent books and new books coming out, a few news items I thought we'd get to. Okay. This show is a whole hodgepodge of different we're, things. We're just, we're just kind of throwing things out there today. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's good news about Ringo, that he's working on a new album. Mm -hmm. And the word that we've heard is that Steve Lukather is working with him on the album. And he's such a great musician and guitar player. Right. And, um, also Richard Marks, who was in one of, uh, Ringo's all-star bands back in 2006. He's a really good guitar player too. Great guitar player and good songwriter and singer. He's writing a song with Ringo for the new album. And Richard, in fact, actually, um, he wrote a song with Ringo a couple albums back on the Why Not album. Really good song, too, called Mystery of the Night. So um, good news to hear about Ringo. That, that is good. You know, I just hope that uh, it would be nice if the album was finished by the time he tours. True. And maybe we get a, a sampling of one or two songs from the new album, as he has been doing since uh, Ringo 2012 came out with two songs from that album. So how do you feel about Richard Marks getting involved? I'm I'm happy to see somebody working with Ringo. Um, any any another perspective would be would be good for him. Uh, I I think that's a 
I mean, I've been real. Ha- I was real happy with the last two albums. Anyway, I liked them. Um, They're very so. good. They're definitely very good. I love yeah. the sound and the production on them. And Steve mm-hmm. Lukather, you know, it, it's a really good move. I like all the musicians Ringo works with. He he works with the cream of the crop. The sum is sometimes better than the parts, but he and he he knows how to pick them. Hmm. He okay. knows how to pick them. Uh, news about Paul. We do know now that he will be playing in Chile. And actually, according to the reports, the published reports in South America, he's going to be several other places down there. Although, as of today, which is the 12th, he hasn't announced any other shows yet besides the, the Chile one, um, which um, they set up the, pre- the pre-sale is just started today. Mm-hmm. today. Um, but... Uh, and actually, I'm surprised he hasn't announced more shows because they use the word imminently when they announce the uh, the San Diego show. But um, that should happen. Uh, I, I would I'd be surprised uh, if something doesn't happen tomorrow. But um, that's it's going to be an interesting tour um, to see where he goes. The rumors are flying heavily, and I've been hearing from sources that um, he's going. He's going to several places. It's going to be a, a worldwide thing. It's going to be he's going to be not just stuck in this side of the world. So, hmm. I've been hearing Japan, mm-hmm. and and I have heard the U.S. And there was a report uh, about Korea. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And so he may be going to Korea too. And that would be the first time ever he's played there. Right. Right. So we'll see. Uh, we'll I'm sure we'll hear hear more word within the next month. Of, and uh, more shows. Also, uh, Paul just gave an interview to KCSN Radio in uh, Los Angeles. And, uh-huh. and in the interview, he said that uh, he was making a new video for Early Days. Mm, okay. So that means that's the next single or emphasis cut. So they're still working the album. And so I'm going to be wondering once this tour starts if that's the song that he'll be adding to the uh, set list. Mm-hmm. Speaking of new interviews, there's also a new interview from, I think it's 2003 or 2005, that popped up on iTunes recently, um, where he actually talks about the, the whole controversy over the McCartney-Lennon-Lennon-McCartney <laughs> yeah. credit thing, which is interesting, because he, he tried to you know, talk it down and tried to spin it, saying uh, it wasn't, as, you know, wasn't what everybody was making it out to be, and, but anyway... So if that's a, that's an interesting uh, interesting interview. I think it's uh, five ninety five, I think, or something. It's mm. or it's relatively cheap. It may be cheaper than that. I can't remember how, how much it is, but it's relatively cheap. Okay. So. The other big news that Paul said in this this um, this interview mm-hmm. was that he is working right now on a new animated film, which we've been hearing about for quite a while, but um, he's working on the music for the film right now. And uh, this this has to be the one that he's talked about called High in the Clouds, which is um, a children's story. It came out as a book, and uh, Paul was one of the authors of this book. And so it could be another situation, kind of like, well, this would be a full length animated film. Right? Does the guy ever? Does the guy ever stop? <laughs> no. No, he does not. And then, of course, there was the news that came out uh, yesterday about the new animated uh, kid series, right? Beat Bugs, which, which is going to have Beatle songs, but not Beatle music. So that's going to be uh, interesting. Well, what you mean is other artists covering Beatles songs, uh, right, not, other, not other the Beatles covering. recordings being used. Right. So that's kind of interesting, and it, it could be a very big way that Beatles music is introduced to young audiences. Mm-hmm. So this will be a TV animated series. We don't know um, what there channel's going to... There was no gonna, date on the news yeah. stories that I saw um, about it. So the word got out in advance, so we don't know anything. One thing that uh, um, I just happened to just to run across this the other day, as far as kids animated... I mean, everybody knows about the um, Powerpuff Girls, a uh, little tribute to the Beatles, but there was another one. I just happened to run across it. I had no idea of it before. By the Wonder Pets called Save the Beatles, B-E-E-T-L-E-S. And it's on DVD. And the storyline says, The Wonder Pets' journey to Liverpool 
to save four beetles, as in B-E-T-L-E-S, trapped in a yellowish submarine. <laughs> I've never seen this. When did this I've come out? I've never seen I, I haven't. Uh, I have the DVD in my hand. I have not seen it myself yet. I intend to, to look at it. Um, I, it's not really, I think it's live action as opposed to, uh, or I should say stop action as opposed to animation, hmm. um, drawing animation. But um, for those of you that are looking for every single um, authenticated you know, Beetle Link thing, um, it is on DVD. It's called, like I said, it's called Wonder Pets Save the Beetles. It with again with B E E T L E S. Hmm. So okay. There you go. All right. Well, that's uh, some of the news items. I'm most excited about the animated film from Paul, though. Because okay. I, I loved Rupert and the Frog Song. I did I too. Thought, I, I actually, I, I really did. I really loved that. I remember watching that in the theater and enjoying that quite a bit. Mm-hmm. The song, that song stuck with me for a long time. You know, song. that's a song that often gets roasted <laughs> online from fans. Really? Saying that, you know, what an embarrassment, you know, and uh, oh my gosh. one of his worst moments and stuff like that. But people forget, this is for an animated children's film. <laughs> right. No, I, I don't. I don't. I don't buy into that roasting at all. I mean, I'm not. I'm somewhat critical of Paul, but that that was a great song. I, I really like that song a lot. Yeah. So, in fact, there there was a DVD that came out of Paul's of the work he's done for animated films, and there's right. a series of shorts, and it's wonderful. I highly recommend it. I. You know, I think that's. I'm not positive, but I think it's out of print. Um, that's a shame if it's true. There's another film that was made called Tropic Island Hum. And it's it's very much in the same vein to me as Rupert and the Frog Song and the song that Paul composed for that, and Linda sings with Paul in in, in the uh, in the song. It's just perfect. It's it's very Disney esque. Mm-hmm. It could have fit in Jungle Book, and Paul has always been. He said that he's a, a fan of Disney, Disney films. So a lot of this music fits very well. And we all know that going back to the the whole story of Rupert, that Paul acquired the rights for Rupert the Bear. Which, which, for people who are listening that don't know what that is, it's very much a very popular um, children's character, animated character in England, kind of like their Winnie the Pooh. And um, Paul had plans of, of making a full-length feature film on Rupert, and he wrote a whole score, which has been bootlegged, and it never came out for one reason or another. But they made the short, which has the song We All Stand Together, which I think is wonderful. The, by the like, correction, because I'm just sitting here looking on my computer, the uh, Paul McCartney Music and Animation Collection is not out of print. Good. In fact, it's extremely cheap, very cheap. So if you have not picked it up, um, you can get it. Uh, I'm, I'm. You can get it uh, for under. Looks like for under five dollars. Hmm. Wow. Definitely pick it up. Not only did Paul write the music for that, but Paul and Linda did the voices for the characters. Right. So it's a real treat. Yes. So sir. if this is a full-length animated film, which it looks like it will be, and uh, I'm just so looking forward to that. And uh, from what I understand, because I looked online, it does have a release date of 2015. Okay. We don't know what month, but something okay. for next year. Okay. Anyway, very quickly, I thought uh, you and I would run down some thoughts about either books that are coming out or recent books that have come out. Because there are some people that we've interviewed and not really reviewed the books. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, we've talked extensively about Lewis, and mm-hmm. we, talk, we we talked uh, extensively about. I mean, the main, you know, if you really, if you have to pick, obviously, Lewis is one. Howlett, Kevin Howlett's BBC book is another. Agreed. I just got a hold of uh, Robert Rodriguez's solo in the '70s, who we will be interviewing um, next week. Can I say that? Mm-hmm. Possibly. Okay. We're, yes. we're, we're shooting for that. We're shooting for next week. Um, and it's a, like his other books, It's uh, there's a lot of information in here. I have not, I've only gone through it uh, lightly. It has tons of information, lots of graphics. Uh, he's really done his homework with this one. It's, um, to me, when I look at it, it's very much in the format of Fab Four FAQ. Um, yeah. You know what yeah. the the two books he put out there with lots of different chapters with different themes to them, and just from the very beginning, and I've only read so far the first twenty pages or so. There's a whole chapter in there on on videos the Beatles made as solo artists in the seventies, mm-hmm. and then he goes into lawsuits, 
that the Beatles were involved with in the 70s. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can pick whatever the topic is that you want to read about going by the chapter that you want instead of reading it from page one all the way through. Some people prefer that. So, um, yeah, uh, hopefully we'll be talking to him on our next show. His, his book goes, is, is all about the solo years. There's a new series, and I just got this the other day, um, by Anthony Robistelli. Uh, it's called I Want to Tell You, Volume 1, Definitive Guide to the Music of the Beatles, Volume 1, 1962-63. to 63. Uh, Robistelli uh, goes through every song and has recording dates, instrumentation, take numbers, personnel, history. There's a lot of information in here. I, to be honest, I have not really look through this heavily yet mm -hmm. um i mean there's been other books there have been other books that have done basically the same thing he's starting way at the beginning obviously and going through you know going through uh the first book starts with uh a please please me lp and then goes to the with the beatles lp so um obviously there's going to be several volumes before this is done okay um, but, um, I mean, if you're looking for another kind of reference book, you know, for that, for song-by-song -song information, this is it. He does not go, at least on the first two albums, he does not use any, there's no unreleased tracks here. It's all stuff that's been released, and plus single tracks. So I'm just go. wondering what, what he has to offer in his book that you can't get from, say, Mark Lewison's work. Well... It's not the same kind of book. I mean, it's a, you know, are you talking about the recording sessions book? Yeah, um, and the complete Beatles Chronicle. Yeah. Um, well, for one, the everything is consolidated so that the, for example, the Love Me Do chapter is um, about thirteen pages long. Hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, in other words, as opposed with Lewison, where Lewison has everything separated by date. This has everything by song. Okay. So all the information is in one spot rather than... Uh, and, I mean, again, he's not the first person to have done it. Um, there have been several other books that have done, you know, this, too. But um, it's interesting, you know, where he's starting. And, like I said, he goes... He, there's a lot of facts in the chapters. Uh, for example, I'm looking at the Baby, Baby It's You chapter, and, again, he's got all the recording dates, the number of takes, the overdub takes the mixing dates, the release dates, both uh, in the U.S. and the U.K., um, studios, studio personnel, the tempos, the keys, and the and the personnel on the on the each on the recording. Okay. So, and then there's all then then there's the history after that. So there's so a it, lot. Yeah, it's packing as much as you can about each individual song. Right, right. That's uh that just came out. Okay. I thought that I would mention, since we had him as a guest already, David Bedford. Oh, yeah. The Fab 104, I definitely would recommend that book. Yeah. I really enjoyed I mean, it. That, that's a, I, was really, I was really impressed at the depth he went to uh, for that. I mean, that was just, there were all sorts of surprises in there uh, that uh, I didn't expect to see. Yeah. Well, the thing is, the format of that book, he spends only a few pages on each person. Mm -hmm. It was covering. So if it's someone you may not have that strong an interest in, it's only a couple of pages. So, you know, it holds your interest right. on that level. But there's so many people that you've heard of in Beatle history that maybe you don't know too much about, exactly. and he fills you in on that. And there's a bunch of people you haven't heard of. That's true. In there, which is really astounding. Um, Jan Janice the Stripper, for example. That's true. It's worth <laughs> it just for that. I did Janice the Stripper. <laughs> and also... It makes you more aware of, of certain people really having a bigger role in the Beatles story than we've been led to believe. Mm -hmm. Now, also, you could say you got to be careful with that because maybe David is elevating the status of some of these people. Maybe they don't deserve as much credit. Well, I Who think knows? that's true. Not, I mean, you can look at all sorts of, you know, just about any Beatles book, you know, done by somebody other than the Beatles, and... You know, there are several, there are books that, you know, have minor characters that, you know, get uh, their moment in the spotlight. And the thing with David's book is they're all part of Beatle history, even a minor part. Right. And that's what 
that's the great part of his book if you keep that you know keep that in mind that you know not everybody in that book is you know is a front line person i mean Janice the stripper is certainly a front line character as much as the you know despite the fact that she you know she was on stage with them mm-hmm. you know so i think you have to keep that in perspective i think I, he's i don't think i just i wouldn't say he's elevating anybody i you know it's a matter of putting the history out there for what it is and i think that's a good thing yeah well certain people like especially lord woodbine mm-hmm. um you know realizing he played a much more important role yeah in, in beetle a, history yeah that's it I mean, and and again, that's the same kind of thing that that you know Lewis's book does too. Is mm-hmm. you know, is to has the information on these people that we didn't know, and so it, it's it's all for good. It's all a good thing. Okay, so. we interviewed James A. Mitchell. Yes, uh, I enjoyed yep. his book tremendously. I, you know, I have to say that having grown up through that era, I was a little not real enthusiastic about that because I really didn't put that much importance on that period. But after reading through the book, I got a new appreciation from it because it was a lot, there were a lot of things there that I guess I just had forgotten. I know when I was talking last week about the Nixon presidency versus today and some of the things that are going on, um, it just didn't make, uh, reading through James' book was, was really kind of a uh, refresher course mm-hmm. of what what happened back then. And, well, um, I like it a lot because it focuses on a couple of years, specifically, when mm-hmm. John was with Elephant's Memory. And I wish there'd be a lot more attention given to the band, because this was the only band that John ever hired. Right. Or actually, he has to be in their band. <laughs> right. Because everything right. else that John did in his solo career were all friends of his or studio musicians. This was and, the only but time. I like also I also like the political perspective, right? You know, somewhat like uh, like the U.S. versus John Lennon too. Uh, although I think this is he, I think James did in some respects a better job than the U.S. versus John Lennon because that was more of an authorized thing, where this is not. Um, although um, I suspect that Dioko knew but know, knows about this book, but. I think it's, I, I think he did a great job. I really did. Hmm. I really did. So do I. Um, Larry Kane. Yes. What do you think of his book? Um, I, I I liked Larry's book. Uh, Larry got Larry. Uh, you know, a lot of that information. Uh, all, all I can say is that you know I like it. he's getting. We're, we're getting so much early history at one time. That's true. There's a parallel there between Mark Lewison's book. David Bedford's book and Larry Kane. It's right. all the and early it's, years. It's hard to you know. It's hard to compare the. They all have they all have different aspects of of the early history that they're that they're touching on. I mean, uh, David is a historian. Mark is a historian. Larry was there, mm-hmm. you know, although not in in some of the things in in his you know in that early early history. But I mean, David, you know, had I mean, uh, Larry has such uh, contact with them, so. Um, I think that's it's great that all this stuff is coming out. It's too bad it had to wait for the 50th anniversary, but I'm glad it's coming out. Yeah. Well, I like the fact that Larry tries to give much more credit to certain people in the history of the Beatles. Same way David Bedford tries to do it. Certain people like Bill Harry or Bob Wooler mm-hmm. or Alan Williams or those people. And, um, you know, I like the book for that reason. I can't say that I, I think that it's totally accurate. Because um, a lot of his information is based upon the people that he interviewed. So, I mean, we had our conversation here. And unfortunately, because we were pressed for time when we, when we had him here, I had to do my live show right after this. But I, I certainly did not agree with his point of view about Pete Best being fired because he was the most popular Beatle. You know, that's based upon the people that he interviewed. So he has a right to print that based on that. But uh, I, I certainly don't see it that way. Well, as, as we as we discuss with Larry and as we discuss with David, there are there is a you know a, there is that feeling out there, whether we agree with it or not. There there are I mean there are people out there who are still very loyal to Pete and are not still you know have not 
uh, agreed with what the Beatles did uh-huh. or the way the Beatles did it. If you're, and, ta- you're talking about fans, well, yeah, I mean, especially, I mean, he's got a, you know, as we said here before, there's a lot of hometown loyalty, and they have, and that's, uh, you know, uh, you can you can say, you know, in uh, because of what happened in history that uh, it's right or wrong, but. Uh, there's a lot of people who still feel very loyal to Pete and and are still very supportive, and I and think that's actually a good thing for his for his case. Well, the fans have a right to feel whichever way they want to, but they also don't know what was going on behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. So, so anyway, any, any other books you want to mention? Um, one is uh, "She Loves You" by Jude Sutherland Kessler. It's her third issue, third volume in the in her John Lennon bio series. Which, um, and I've talked with her several times about this. There's been a lot of, there, are, there is a faction of people who think it's all, her books are fiction. And I discuss it with her and, and several times. And I call them uh, enhanced biographies because that's what they are. And uh, she's not the first person to do this. Um, she admits that. You know, uh, I mean, I, I know for a fact that she does a lot of research, a ton of research, and it's a lot of it is detailed, and she loves you. So I, I'm very, you know, I, I'm very supportive of what she's doing. Um, and and we do hope to interview her as well. We do, it's, yes. Eventually, we, yeah, we we hope to get her too. It's and tough it's, to do it all all at the same time. There's so many books coming I know, out that's, all at the same time. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we're doing this today. And then the other book I wanted to mention, I wrote about uh, last week. It's called Sex and the Beatles, 400 Entries by Jeff Walker. Um, 400 this is exactly what it says. It's all the incidences of sex in the Beatles' history. Every little detail that you'd ever want to know, or actually I, I kind of made it kind of an embarrassed remark in my review, and I said never wanted to know, and I was kind of joking there, but... Mm-hmm. If you if you have that kind of an interest and you ever wanted to know what kind of you know uh, about sex and the Beatles uh, and all the little uh, dirty little details, they're all in this book. Four hundred entries of them, uh, and uh, he he's covered them all. He really has. He goes starts back with uh, you know Pete Best and goes all the way through the end. And the, the only I guess if I had one quibble, it would be the sources because he uses. One, uh, he uses, uh, for example, Albert Goldman um, yeah. as one of his sources. So he didn't dismiss any sources, and I asked. That was one of the things I asked him about. But other than that, I mean, there's every everything that's there. Every little detail is there. Okay. So, there you go. All right. Um, I want to mention just two more. One of which is um, Lawrence Juber has a new book coming out, and that's in May called Guitar and, with Wings. And we've both seen that, and. Uh, um, I thought it was. I thought it was very well done. There's a lot of uh, new pictures of all that you uh, will have not seen. A lot of details, uh, of both of you know his life and with wings. So that's what you get with with Florence's book. Okay, and finally, there's a new book out from Chuck Gunderson called yes. "Some Fun Tonight," and. Hopefully, as soon as I'm done with Robert Rodriguez's book, then I'll be tackling that one, and it looks fantastic. It's, I, I can't believe how heavy it is. I mean, it's I've seen some heavy Beatle books, but Chuck's is huge, and I mean huge. Yeah, it goes in depth into the North American tours of the Beatles, 64, 65, 66, a lot of information about individual shows that we probably don't have never heard before, interviews with MCs for the shows, um, stuff from the press conferences. It's packed with a lot. And like you said, it's really heavy. There's two two thick volumes right? Uh, for this book. Let me mention one more really quick is uh, Dave Hull's Hullabaloo. Dave Hull was um, on Carol A. And Carol A., uh, as everyone knows, uh, Bob Eubanks uh, did the uh, Hollywood Bowl, uh, did the Beatles in Los Angeles, Hollywood Bowl shows in, the, in Dodger Stadium. So and there's details about that, and there's also a lot of details about other things. It's not just a Beatle book. He talks about the monkeys. He talks about a whole lot of other stuff. But um, so there's another book that uh, you might be interested in too. Okay. So that puts a wrap on this week's show. Um, if you want to get a hold of us, 
We are on Facebook. We have uh, a page on Facebook. We also have a new Things We Said Today group on Facebook to talk about the show, and you're more than welcome to, to join in. For me, uh, you can get a hold of me um, through my email, beaglesexaminer at gmail.com. I also have a, a, Facebook pa- a personal Facebook page. I have Facebook pages for all of my columns, and I have a Beagles News and Commentary page. Ken? If you want to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can also look at my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. There's a ton of interviews on there with people connected to the Beatles, and many of the people that we've interviewed on this show, I've done private interviews with, people like David Bedford and James A. Mitchell and um, a whole bunch of good people. Mark Rivera is on there, Chad Stewart, Mark Lewison. Alan Cozen. It's all on the website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, and there's trivia every single week, and you can win lots of prizes as well. So by all means, check that out, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And don't forget my Beals Examiner and all my other Examiner columns on Examiner.com. Well, that's it for things we said today. This is Steve Marinucci saying we will see you next time. And this is Ken Michaels for things we said today, thanking each and every one of you for listening. And we will see you next time.